the statue for your robotics and automation society the local chapter. This is the, the chapter for Santa Clara Valley as well as Oakland East Bay and, and, and San Francisco, although most of our meetings are here. So uh, if you're interested in, in, in robotics, this is a good organization to join. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, we, we also ask you that uh, if you don't mind, sign your, your name so we, we know who, who has come to this meeting? It can't be an official lunch for the chapter. There's no pizza. <laughs> well, you know, we, we actually would like to encourage more people to, to, to help us because one of the reasons we don't have pizza is because we, we need more help. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you want to help, please. And, and then we can maybe have pizza and, and other things uh, going on. Um, so we, we try to have as frequent meetings as possible. Most of these meetings tend to be fairly research oriented and, and, and that's what we like to position those as, like that and, and, and technical. Uh, there are other organizations in the Bay Area that focus more on, on hands-on and, and other types of uh, issues related to robotics. But if you're interested in other areas, please let us know and we can maybe do more stuff with that. But uh, we're gonna start the meeting and, uh, and then I want to add uh, program chair, Dr. Ed Katz, introduce our, the speaker. But uh, in the meantime, please sign this up if you haven't signed it. I'll just pass it around. Okay, so good evening. Our speaker tonight is uh, Oli Mingshol, who is a director and associate research professor here at Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley. Uh, prior to uh, Coming here, he was uh, um, involved with Boeing, NASA, Rockwell Automation, Rockwell Collins. Um, he has a PhD in computer science from the University of Illinois, and he's a distinguished uh, speaker in this topic that he's going to be talking about tonight. So please welcome uh, Professor Ringshaw. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. Um, let's see if we can find. Is it the, the Apple box that works? Oh, okay. That's a new. That's a new thing yeah. since last time I gave a talk here, so I shouldn't be scared of the Apple thing here. Anyways, I will be talking about the um, the um, the Bayesian methods for system health management, and. Um, I'm going to have a slide or two here with some motivation and arguing for the need need for this type of, of uh, research and also these type of uh, um, software and hardware systems. And there's been many, you know, um, unfortunate events related to um, aviation. Some of this work has been funded by NASA, so that's why you see um, a lot of NASA-oriented uh, examples here. One example that was very sad was the Suicide 111 back in 98. Of course, some of these, uh, also Mars, um, both rovers and polar lander have had problems due to um, combinations of batteries or power system failures and software problems. Um, uh, Ariane 5 is an other <coughs> example, and uh, probably one of the earliest known uh, software uh, bugs or, or problems in terms of the overflow that led to uh, destruction of the rocket. So um, um, that's the motivation. And what do I mean by system health management? I thought I'd break it down and give a little bit of an, uh, uh, specifics here. Uh, when we say a system, or at least when I say a system, I will, at least for the purpose of this talk, mean a complex engineer systems, so it could be software, it could be some kind of device, um, power system, a vehicle, you know, space, aero. Um, and then we're in, interested in the health 
of this system. And here's where the Bayesian or the, uh, the Bayesian network model comes into to play because you have this complex engineer system, you want to monitor certain aspects, you want to understand how healthy the system is, and um, at least what I prefer to do when I'm faced with that problem is to, to structure this, this system and represent it in terms of a multivariate probability distribution. And uh, we'll come back to this later, but in essence, what we're doing is we're computing the posterior distribution over some of the random variables that we're interested in, given the state or the, the, um, uh, the conditioning here, the evidence that we have. And this is called the VR approach. And we say system health management because we're interested in a broad range of issues that are all the way from designing um, a vehicle or a device or software to a detection, diagnosis, prognosis, prognosis and mitigation. Actually during this talk here today, I will be focusing mostly on the, the diagnostic aspects. But um, I think it's fair to say this is a fairly broad topic that, uh, and we want to include those and be concerned about those uh, and that's why we use this uh, word management. So just a brief overview of the talk. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Bayesian networks, I will introduce those very briefly. Um, and I will then go on to talk about the system health management using this Bayesian approach. Um, talking about software, uh, electrical power system, uh, feedback computing, and also a little bit about GPUs. I think I have a fairly ambitious uh, schedule here, but I'll try to go through quickly and um, motivate you perhaps to take a closer look at the, the papers uh, that I, you can find on my website. And I should also emphasize that this, uh, much of this, probably all of it is joint work. And uh, uh, I do not take full credit for all these, um, um, uh, these papers or these areas of research. And I'm glad to say that one of my uh, frequent collaborators, Johan Schumann, is in the audience today, is waving. And uh, we'll get back to some of the joint work with him uh, in a few slides. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Bayesian networks and junction trees. Um, the idea with the Bayesian network, of course, is that um, in your statistics 101 class, you typically, or, or we typically, took this assumption of marginal independence. We had many random variables. We assumed they were all uh, IID, so they're all independent typically. And that's, you know, that's reasonable. That makes life easy from sort of a mathematical point of view. The problem with that is that when you, you uh, observe a more complex mechanism where there are dependencies, it is just too simple. <clears throat> on the other hand, on the other extreme, if we can you know, make no independence assumptions at all and just say that everything depends on everything else. And that's very general but it is just too unrealistic and too complex, you know, at least in exponential complexity, and it's just not feasible to manage and, and have that non-trivial applications. So at the end of the day, uh, we try to strike a balance here and try to allow some independence and some de dependence in our model, and the Bayesian network uh, has become quite popular. Um, it, you restrict yourself to directed asymptotic graphs, and this leads to conditional probability table that's exponential, sort of locally exponential. So it's exponential in size, uh, in the number of parents that you have, um, but it's not exponential in the total number of nodes that you have in your graphical model. So that's sort of the um, that's the good news there. And of course, there are many interesting special cases, such as uh, the Markov chain. Uh, tree structured uh, graphical models, etc. And here's a quick example. Um, the Bayesian network is a compact representation of a joint probability distribution. So every time you see a graph like this in this presentation, if you prefer, you can just think about it as a joint distribution. <clears throat> and the nice thing now is that <clears throat> you might be familiar with the chain rule in probability theory. Um, here it is. We can just sort of condition on one, one by one random variable here. You can always do that. 
in the Bayesian network, we can simplify due to this, this graph structure, and we only need to work with these smaller conditional distribution and not these, these longer ones that can, when you have a large number of random variables, can be quite tedious to work with. So we're trying to find or use our knowledge of the local structure in the particular domain and take advantage of that both for specifying the conditional probabilities in the in the Bayesian network, as well as the um, um, you know minimize the amount of uh, cases that you might need when you try to learn this from from data. That's your approach that you're taking. So here's a quick example. I'm not going to bog you down in too much math today. So I'm taking sort of an informal approach to introducing this this Bayesian network um, formalism. Um, some of you might remember this type of device from the old days. I'm actually still using it. I admit that really even to my students. And the idea here is that you have a CD. You might have heard about them, maybe not seen them. Uh, the idea is it's a circular thing. It's silver, typically silver, you know, colored. And you put it in here, and you plug this into the wall outlet where you have a battery here. This spins around, and there's a laser, and uh, this creates music many times, at least when I use this device. You mean there's no meter? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite amazing. And uh, here's this very simple Bayesian network to um, figure out, you know, 50% of the time when I use this, uh, something is wrong. You know, um, this is what, what you get when faculty tries to use it, some kind of fancy uh, equipment. And uh, here is the observable. So here's what I see is not working properly. Um, there's either no light, so there's an indicated light here somewhere. Maybe let's say this is an indicated light. There's bad or no sound. And also the other thing is you can see through this, this little glass here whether the uh, CD is spinning or not. <clears throat> and then there's these underlying causes or these underlying um, causes of failure or, or hidden state or, or system state, if you will, that uh, uh, have an impact on these different observables. And then the idea is that you have these rules that you can either learn from the data or you can input yourself, being an expert on these types of uh, uh, devices. So for instance, if there's a media fault and the CD might not spin, if the CD does not spin, there's there is or spins poorly, whatever that means. There's no or bad sound, etc. <clears throat> so here are the conditional probability tables. You go ahead and spin, uh, specify these or learn them from data. Um, for the purpose of our discussion today, that doesn't really matter. We just we assume. We, I'm not going to emphasize the machine learning today. So we just assume that this, the structure of the Bayesian network is there. Um, the conditional probability tables are or filled with these uh, probabilities, these parameters. And uh, that's what we're working with. Now we can use this for to diagnose or to understand whether our system is healthy or not. So here's an example. Everything is wrong. So there's no light, there's no sound, and the CD is not spinning. <clears throat> and guess what? The most likely fault then when we look at these marginal probabilities, so we look at, this is our evidence down here, these, all these, so we have clamped with these nodes, as it's also known as, and we compute these posterior distributions so for each of these random variables, these, these nodes that we're interested in, we compute this posterior distribution. We can see that the power fault is most likely now, given what we have, have seen. On the other hand, um, sorry, uh, LED can be lighting, and everything else is wrong. And this, you know, suggests that power fault is not um, it's not valid anymore, but it's it's a media fault. And as a matter of fact, we often don't work with the with this Bayesian network directly. We compile it, and I'm going to leave that as a black box today. Um, we compile it to some kind of secondary data structure, such as a junction tree or um, arithmetic circuit. And the benefit of these is that you can now work uh, in very simple arithmetic operations. And I'll get back to this with the GPU. And you can also 
um, just propagate two times over this data structure. So instead of having to, you know, have a very complicated algorithm work on your basic network, you propagate just twice over the uh, this junction tree and compute the marginals. So here's sort of a comprehensive approach to this probabilistic diagnosis. Um, you have your um, your Bayesian network. Actually, in general, you have some kind of system specification, but I'm not I'm, I'm cutting that under the rug today. Uh, from that system specification, you then compute or you generate this this Bayesian network. You have an offline compilation step, and then um, as a result of that, you have the junction tree, or perhaps an arithmetic circuit, and this is what is being used online. And um, I'm emphasizing this for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that once you have this junction tree or some other more um, deterministic structure, or, or, or um, what's the right word? Uh, more, um, um, you know, something that's closer to what you're actually comfortable to work with on the on the binary level, if you will. You have a much more deterministic uh, computation time as well. Oops, I'm still going the wrong way. And so this is sort of overview of what might be going on um, when you do this approach to to system health management. There's a number of applications of Bayesian networks, and I'll be emphasizing system health management today, but um, you know, spam filtering is very popular. There's there's nice correspondence between error correction coding and Bayesian networks. Um, biology and medical have also become uh, key areas of, of uh, application for Bayesian networks, and there's quite a few others as well. So um, hopefully you can apply this to other areas that you're interested in. Here are some of the, I'm first going to, probably went a little bit faster over this. I'll, I'll first talk about the software. Uh, Excuse me, you said all the references are at your website. That's Can right. You give your website address. Yes, I'll do that actually towards the end there, but I'll, I'll show it for you first. So here are the uh, references you can find there. And here are some of the um, the references. And here, um, should really mention Johan Schumann again. He's been a key collaborator in this area of software system health management. And this is actually just a few of the the um, the papers that we have written on this topic. And uh, as I mentioned, this has been very um, uh, much in focus with our work with NASA. And here are two examples. Um, Mars Rover Spirit had this interesting reboot loop after landing, um, and there was a problem with data storage, um, but it was possible to actually recover from this software problem, as you might remember. Uh, um, on the Mars Polar Lander side, though, it's quite a different story. Here, it was lost, and this, at least it's currently believed, was due to a software problem where the the engine, the rocket engine that was supposed to ensure safe landing on Mars, uh, was shut down too early, and the lander just crashed into the surface of Mars. At least this is the current theory. And in general, um, more and more of these autonomous and manned systems depend on large and complex onboard software. And this is the case in aerospace, in cars, in almost all our devices now, we see more and more emphasis on software. And despite a lot of verification and validation, um, there's still software bugs that show up. 
And in aerospace now, I, I, from what I hear, there's 10 times as much um, cost associated with testing as in development. And I can imagine that's an extreme case, but in all industries, there is a certain amount of V and V, but even in, in, um, in aerospace, which is so focused on, on software quality, V and V, there's still some bugs that come through. And therefore, this idea of, of having sort of a safety belt for software, where the bugs that are able to get through, you should still be able to try to catch them at the right time. That's the idea here. Here's an example of a guidance navigation and control system. Um, we have, of course, um, a lander here, but this is the case for uh, also an arrow, not only space applications, and uh, very briefly guidance is where do I want to go and how do I get there? Navigation is where am I? And control is which actuators do I need to, to use to keep stable? And of course, you see similar systems now in cars, uh, probably also in robotics, even though that's not my area of expertise. <coughs> and um, I even claim these days that the cell phone, in a way, is becoming more and more like these types of devices, where you maybe don't control things, but you're certainly interested in both guidance and navigation. So this type of these types of concerns where you have a you know physical device, you have lots of software, I think is becoming the norm more and more these days. Here's the um, Architecture that you have on the um, on the um, flight computer side or on the aero side, um, you have the hardware, you have the operating system, you have the communication link, you have the navigation guidance control, and um, in in aerospace you typically have these hardened real time operating systems such as VxWorks. Uh, RT Linux um, and these software components they they run at different frequencies that range from maybe two hertz up to 100 hertz maybe even faster um, and uh, the characteristics of the software is very uh, diverse as you can see here um, you have mode logic you have numerical computation you have state machines you have control loops you have common filters uh, communication operating system type of software, of course, and more general purpose algorithms. And these run at different update or refresh rates. And you have um, potential bugs such as the following. Um, and I'm not going to emphasize that too much. But the idea now is that the Bayesian network um, looks at, I have a more complex Bayesian network later on, but here's just a simple example. It, it monitor you have the, the, the health of your uh, component that you're interested in, and then you have various observable um, facts or evidence that that you then can infer something about your hidden uh, cause or your health status by looking at these these observables such as oil pressure, vibration, um, and Here's another type of uh, data structure that we use for compiling into from the Bayesian network. This is an arithmetic circuit. And again, the benefit of this is that it can be uh, computed a bit very uh, quickly, and the algorithms are quite simple. <clears throat> so what do we use you know, in a in a more realistic um, situation. Where do we take our evidence or our input to the basement? <clears throat> There's actually already in the um, operating system um, different sensors, if you will, that we can use. There's <coughs> software intent, um, and there's also information from the software in itself. And uh, one thing that's notable is that even though we, we looked into this uh, uh, use of a dynamic or a temporal Bayesian network, in the end, we are using a static base net, and we're not really trying to model time in the network itself. <clears throat> the benefit of this at, is that the modeling effort is simpler. It's simpler to debug and understand what's going on. Um, 
course, the disadvantage is that there are certain temporal um, effects that we now need to sort of capture outside of the Bayesian network as features and feed them into the Bayesian network. Um, here's a very small case study, and this is a, a very low capability uh, hardware platform. And uh, as you can see here, very simple rover. And uh, we have uh, we're using OSEC, which is very widely used in automotive as the operating system. And we have different tasks. Um, we have our um, compilation that we spoke about earlier. I'm really not familiar with this mouse, so I'll just move on here. But here's a very simple uh, scenario that is inspired by the Mars Polar Lander. And we have um, different um, sensor signals here, such as the rotation of the wheel, uh, touch, uh, voltage of the battery, etc. <laughs> it might be better, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Okay, so maybe I'll try to use this function still. Okay, so here's the various sensor signals, and uh, there's more sensors here. This is a little bit coarse, so I'm not sure how. But the general idea is that. We see here until, you know, here in the beginning, everything is, you know, broadly speaking, looking pretty good. And then at this point, our signals are becoming contradictory or they're becoming uh, ambiguous or they're becoming uh, problematic, if you will. So the, uh, the way our Bayesian network is able to explain that is to say that our, our, there's something wrong with our, our, our software, as you see here the probability of it being healthy is dropping, and also our sensor. So there's something suspicious here going on with our software and our sensor. And this is how we do the, the, the software health management in this particular scenario. And there's many more examples in the, uh, the papers, in this paper here, that's cited as well as the other papers in the, uh, that's on the website. Any questions to that? <clears throat> All right, let's move very quickly to the, the uh, system health management. Um, and this deals with power systems. And there's also a few uh, papers on this topic. And there's a very similar um, motivation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, power is also very important, partly for the reason that um, you know, computers are so important now in a practice spacecraft. <coughs> and um, this is very similar to what we saw already, um, except that here there's a little bit more of a, um, you know, you get a rough idea of what the Bayesian network might look like for, for a power system. And uh, probably hard to see exactly what's going on here, but there is a representation of a, uh, sort of a battery over here, the power is flowing from the battery over to the loads. And this is you know, much, much smaller than what we would see in a realistic uh, power system. And then there's an arithmetic circuit here that is compiled from the Bayesian network. And this is what is used online to uh, um, diagnose, to catch these types of faults, such as strips faults and oft offset faults. This is um, a way that we capture these very subtle um, uh, offsets, for instance, that might occur in a power system. So there's actually a very slight drop here. And um, in order to, to uh, uh, create from this a feature that we can use in our base net, we're actually using this uh, QSUM, which is known from statistics. And um, it achieves two different effects. First of all, we get a much more substantial drop when we use this QSUM feature. And secondly, we normalize it so it, it sort of gets from this 
range here and the uh, you know it's from between 15 and 20 volts and we scale it down so we can we can handle different voltage levels using the same um, basic network structures so this is uh, something we thought was clever and novel and therefore I wanted to to um, show that explicitly here's an example of um, a base net structure and because this is something I'm often asked you know so what does this actually look like how does it work at sort of the detailed level so here's an attempt to reflect that it is a little bit complicated um, I have to admit but let's first look at the nominal case over here <clears throat> and I'll put my glasses on so I can see back there at the same time um, the nominal case is we have this feature that or this observable this piece of evidence that I mentioned that spoke about earlier uh, that we are constructing from the from the um, sensor readings then we also have these these sensor readings that are more directly associated with the with the uh, with the different sensors so for instance we have voltage sensor and it's, it's for instance high um, we have these binary sensors that says this uh, the circuit base character is closed and so forth it could also have been opened but in this case they're closed and given all that information we say that okay our sensor is good our relay is good um, actually battery and so forth okay so in this case we're happy over here um, see here we have this battery feature it's starting to suggest there's a drop in the in in the battery voltage and given all the other information that we have you see here that we are starting to suspect also this voltage sensor but Overall, the most likely diagnosis now, the most probable diagnosis is that there's a problem with the battery. Okay. So by setting up the, uh, the Bayesian network, so putting in the structure in place, putting in the different conditional probability tables, similar to what I spoke about with the boombox earlier, we can then do this type of fault diagnosis. <clears throat> Of course, this was just a small fragment that I showed you earlier. Here's a realistic uh, Bayesian network uh, for a fairly simple power system. This is, um, you know, something you might see uh, not in a you know, full-blown satellite or aircraft or spacecraft. This is just a very simple um, sort of one-stream power system, no redundancy. This is something you might see in a, in a UAV, for instance. You know, here's the battery. Here's the load tank. Here's the Bayesian network. And uh, we have around 150 nodes, a few more edges. And this represents the power system at the level of different components. So each component now, and such as the inverter, the different loads, the battery is represented by, you know, two, three, four random variables. And then you, we are also representing, in this case, the connections of course between the components um, and we could have represented uh, connections or wires also being cut or not working properly we, we haven't done that because in the data set we worked with we knew ahead of time this would not be an issue but of course in general it can be an issue and this this approach would accommodate those type of failures also although we are not doing that currently <clears throat> And this is completely hand constructed, and uh, we have, you know, we have to start looking into also using machine learning to construct the structure of the network itself. But given the size of the data and the complexity of the system, we have so far not been very successful, to be honest. Because the, no the amount of data we have and just the number of nodes. Uh, it is just very hard to learn it completely from there. 
but it's an interesting, you know, it's definitely an interesting uh, research topic to try to do that. <coughs> Here's a little bit of information about, uh, this is, as I think, was one of the most surprising things in this project. And when I first saw it, I almost could not believe it. And it's the time it takes to do computation over this arithmetic circuit. And this is actually larger than what I showed on the previous slide. This has around five to 600 random variables in it. And you see here, when we use this compilation to an arithmetic circuit, it takes less than one millisecond to do the full propagation over these, this large multivariate model. <clears throat> uh, when we do variable elimination, which is working directly on the base net, it takes 20 milliseconds. So you see here, there's a substantial benefit uh, to use this arithmetic circuit instead of this variable elimination algorithm. And then the junction tree is also much slower. Um, this is computing the most probable explanation. This is computing marginals. And uh, you see that the marginal is a little bit slower for some reason using, using ACE, but it's still very, very competitive, much, much faster than this junction tree <coughs> approach. Yes, question? How would you get the initial probabilities for all those variables in the sense of pretty big network? Do you do that by hand? Yeah, you do it by hand, yeah. Yeah, the question was how do you get the uh, those conditional probability tables for this network, for instance, down here, right? Yeah, yeah. It's all uh, in this case manual labor. So you go in and set them by kind of by logic, similar to the logic I showed earlier for the boom box. You can also learn it from data. Um, the problem is, you need this is a pretty large and complex system. So you need a lot of data. So it's not as straightforward as it might seem. And you want also to be able to handle multiple simultaneous failures in different or related parts of the network. So at the end of the day, you know, you, we don't have sort of Google size data sets here in this particular case. We don't have the terabytes or exabytes of data. We have a relatively small data set. But this, I mean, it will depend a lot on the size of the data set, to be honest, because have very large data sets, you can, you can probably learn this from the data instead of having to do manually. That's a big question. And then, of course, we have our um, experimental results. We participated in this competition, and there were three um, three main points here: uh, false been injected simultaneously or sequentially. Uh, there were different types: abrupt, um, parametric, or discrete, and there were in general permanent. So once the failure occurred, it stayed. <coughs> there were both component faults and sensor faults. Without going into too much detail, uh, we had this tier one, which was the simpler base net that I showed you earlier. Then there was a larger one. <coughs> and we actually did very well. We placed number one in both of these competitions. And of course, we were particularly proud of this is ordering down here. <coughs> There's much more to this, to be honest. So I, I refer you to the, the literature if you want to drill down into the details. Um, one thing that we're also interested in is combining uh, feedback control or feedback computing and Bayesian networks. And we've written a few talk, a few papers on this topic. And um, here's the motivation on, or the background, if you will, for this. <clears throat> we have you know, made, made the argument that the system health management is very important. It's also improving. You can use base nets. You can use other technologies that you want to um, investigate. Even if you limit yourself to base nets, there is a broad range of algorithms. And we touched on some of them today, like the junction tree, um, Variable elimination. You should also mention arithmetic circuits here. There's various types of belief propagation, uh, you know, stochastic simulation approaches. And uh, at the same time, at least in many environments, you have a relatively unpredictable environment. Perhaps not in aviation and space where you have a very controlled environment, but on your cell phone, um, on the internet, in a local area network, 
uh, you have uh, a large amount of variability and also of course users behavior varies and uh, the, you know the, the what everyone else is doing is also changing so what we're arguing or, or saying in this research direction is there's a need for reactive computation you know soft real time if you will <clears throat> And here is the big picture view. We have our feedback control loop here. This is traditional, in many ways, traditional feedback control. The key difference is that you have the computer here that we're controlling. So we're trying to control or do something reasonable with our software. And in particular, we're computing these, these uh, health status, P of H given E. And we also have an interest in how fast are we able to compute these posterior distributions? Because if if they arrive too slow, you know they're not going to be very helpful. They're going to come after you know the um, and the real rover um, already was uh, uh, not communicating to us, or they they arrive um, once the vehicle has already crashed, so to speak, into the surface of Mars. There's also some high level issues here, such as what should be my set point? Um, how should I optimize my base net? So far, to be honest, we have mostly focused on the set point. And the set point we have uh, investigated the most is uh, completion time. So how fast can I do my computation? How fast do I need to do my um, Bayesian network computation? We made some simplifying assumptions. Um, we said that we have three type of processes, computational processes. There's a high criticality, which is the phase net health diagnostics. There is some medium criticality, which we, you know, they're there. We don't care about them. We're not too concerned about them. We let them sort of do their own thing. <clears throat> and then there's low criticality, which we are willing to uh, control either um, um, terminate or suspend or push to another computer in the general case. We use again this um, data power system that I spoke about earlier and we investigated a few different algorithms. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about junction tree and like fluid weighting which is a simulation approach. And the for the low criticality processes, we just generated them using a Poisson process, and they are uh, computing um, these math operations. So they're doing something that's very intensive on the CPU, and therefore they're competing with our base net computations, which are also CPU intensive. And see here main message is that as you increase the number of competing processes, um, the base net computations are also taking more and more time. And generation trees, in this case, very fast. The algorithms are a little slower, and there's sort of a linear uh, uh, natural correlation here between the number of pro competing processes and the amount of time it takes to do the, the, health, the system health management computation. In the interest of time, I think I'll skip very quickly through this and just get to the experimental results and show to you that uh, using this, we have the set point now. Uh, this is feedback control, so we want to uh, achieve the set point, and we see that we're able to do that at least reasonably well um, by controlling the number of other processes that are running on our computer. If we set the if we set this set point first to I think it's two seconds here two seconds yes and we up it to four seconds uh, we're able to adjust now the other uh, processes running on our computer accordingly so we're allowing more other processes more other activity now to go on which is a good thing um, and at you know at the cost of being a little bit slower uh, with our health system health management process or diagnostic process using the <coughs> data. 
Um, we can also change the Bayesian inference algorithm. So the junction tree algorithm is very fast um, and in, in many ways a very good algorithm. The Achilles heel of it is it's a memory hog, so it takes a lot of memory. And maybe you want to use that memory for something else. Maybe you have, you're taking a video, um, and you just need to use it for other purposes. Now you can actually switch your, your um, system health management, your base net inference process from the junction tree to something else like the likelihood of waiting, which is a, you know, a stochastic simulation algorithm, and it doesn't need a lot of memory. The flip side of that is that it's an you know approximate it's an approximate approach to doing posterior distribution computation. So you are paying a price, but this shows that um, it can be it can be done, and uh, in this framework of also feedback control. Um, we also investigated adaptive control. It gives better results, and you see here there's a reasonable tracking of this sinusoidal wave, which is uh, in this case our, our, uh, our set point. <clears throat> Any questions to that? I know I went through that fairly quickly because we're it's getting a little bit late here. All right, so let's talk about the, uh, the GPU and um, the, here's the motivation for using the GPU in this case. We know that, you know, we have a Bayesian network, <coughs> can compile it into a junction tree, and here's actually the complete junction tree, or a complete junction tree for this Bayesian network. This, of course, if you fit into the slide, this is a small example. And um, in, in, in actuality, there can be some severe computational challenges with this junction tree, and in particular if the base net is highly connected, or if these nodes in the base net has a large number of states. So remember I said that the, the size of this conditional probability table is exponential, is locally exponential, so if each of these has 10 states in it, you know, you have now 100 parent states, roughly speaking. And if this one also has a hundred states, sorry, ten states, you're up to a thousand, and so forth. So you have a combination of high cardinality of nodes in your base net and highly connected uh, topology. These nodes in the junction tree can actually become quite large. <clears throat> and here's where the GPU comes into play. During message passing, these computations associated with these separator tables are, um, some of them are independent, we'll come back to that, and uh, what's more, some of these junction trees, they have very large cliques and separators. So you can then, the, the sort of the, the rough plan now is to have a different computational thread on the GPU to work inside of these separators, so do the operations that we're doing there. So in essence, we're computing each of these messages in parallel, as much as we can, and um, we embed this in the sort of in a sequential overall junction tree message passing algorithm. And so going back to the diagnostic example again, um, just to, to give you a feeling for how these large junction trees can come about, we have our root nodes that we're interested in estimating. We have our leaf nodes that are observable, so our sensors or tests, if you will. And, um, you know, this is what you input in order to find out what is the, the system health state of your device or your software or your vehicle. Um, we have this click tree or, or junction tree clustering approach. Here's the summary of it. We have a base net. We create what is known as a moral graph. Compile it down to a junction or a click tree. <clears throat> this is well known, and uh, the main article here, the seminal article, came in '88, and uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. But the observation is that as the number of sensors or tests or observables, these leaf nodes in your base net, as they increase, <clears throat> the 
size of the junction tree also increases. And in particular, more and more of these, these cleats that represent the root nodes in the base net, they start showing up. <clears throat> and uh, there's this very, in the beginning, this is sort of a mathematical abstraction of what's going on. In the very beginning, um, your, as you increase the number of tests or, or observables or evidence in your base net, there's a very moderate increase or change in the size of the click tree. But then all of a sudden, here's the derivative, this is the overall growth of the base net, or sorry, the click tree. Starts out at zero and goes, to, you know, flattens out and passing towards <coughs> out. Um, here's the derivative of this growth curve. And you see that there's a very moderate, if you look at this black curve, there's a moderate growth in the beginning. And then all of a sudden it peaks and then it drops off again. <coughs> So this is to motivate that, you know, for systems that we know less about, or you have a lot of connections, if you will, so there's a lot of interdependency, you can quickly be in a situation where your, your uh, junction tree or click tree is quite large, and you might need or might take advantage of this parallelism that the GPU provides. And here's one of the key observations. Here's a clique. Here's another clique. Actually, these are the two cliques from the small examples that, that I showed earlier. Here is the, the BC. It says, yes, BC. So the two random variables, B and C. Here's A, B, and D up here. And let's suppose that they're both binary. So both of these random variables can have state 0 and 1. And Here's the complete clique for one of them. Here's, here's the other complete clique for DC. And you see here all these cells. Here's the separator. Um, what you want to do mathematically is marginalization and scattering. Those are sort of the two main steps in this uh, and doing the propagation over the junction tree. Um, this is actually not just one equation. This is many, many equations. You see i and k here. So this, this i and k run over the cliques and the separators. And if you study very carefully, you see here that the, the light gray operations, they, in the, these cells map to this light gray cell and separator. And likewise for the dark gray map to this one. And this, these are completely independent of each other, so they can be worked on by separate GPU threads. That's the key observation here for the, for the parallelism opportunity, opportunity for uh, in the junction tree. Here's the pseudocode. Um, you can find more in this paper. We also had a paper in 2013 in the fall at KDD that had um, an addition additional wrinkle to it. <clears throat> and that additional wrinkle we call arithmetic parallelism. And the arithmetic parallelism is the observation that the this arithmetic operations that we looked at here, uh, for instance, summation, you know, you can you can sum in this in this tree structure and this can be done in parallel. You don't need to do this sort of, you know, one term at a time. You can you can do it parallel in this tree structure. So now you have two parallelism opportunities. You have the arithmetic parallelism opportunity, and you have this what we call element-wise parallelism opportunity, which is what I spoke about earlier. And it's actually very important for the performance of your GPU how you allocate your threads across the arithmetic and the element part, uh, element-wise parallelism. And here's some examples of that for different <coughs> sizes and separator sizes. Um, here's the number of arithmetic threads. Here's the time it takes to, to do the uh, computation. And I see in some cases, as we increase the number of arithmetic threads, we worse off. Um, 
And if you look at these sizes here, it will make sense to you. Um, and then we have some very strange looking curves over here where um, you really need to be sort of in the middle. You need to give some threads, GQ threads, to one type of parallelism and the other, some threads to the other, to the elementalized type of parallelism in order to achieve optimal performance. And um, it does matter, as you see here, um, the photon is around four um, milliseconds and up to around more than 100 times worse performance here. So in some cases, if you really do something stupid, it could be 100 times worse. In other cases, of course, if you, if you pick a number here in the middle, um, you know, you're generally okay, but still there's, there's something left on the table. So what we said to ourselves was, why don't we try to do a machine learning approach to optimize these parameters? We try different approaches. In the end, we, had, we used support vector regression, or at least found that that was the best technique. And um, as you might know, the support vector regression has a nonlinear transform, weights them, and there's a bias term. In the end, we use these fairly simple, straightforward features. We use just the sizes of the different tables, the separators, the click potentials, number of threads. Um, that's being used for the two different types of uh, um, parallelism. There's also something called the thread block on the GPU, which I glossed over. Um, just to keep, keep us on time. Um, you'll see more about that in the paper. And here's the, the bottom line, if you will. Um, we have different types of Bayesian networks or junction trees here. Here is the speed up that we achieved using this machine learning technique. In the end, we were able to get the best speed up we had. And this is a relatively old GPU part, I should add, um, of around 21x. And this is for this junction tree. You see here, there's, there's on the x-axis, um, there's the size of the separator table. So this is a very large, or it's a large number of these large separators. So there's a lot of parallelism <coughs> between them here. On the other hand, and that's why we get this, this very good speed up. On the other hand, this, this guy um, is based on called pigs. It's basically a family tree for pigs. And um, so you can imagine that's very close to being tree structured, right? Um, and a tree structured base net <coughs> doesn't really create a lot. Of, it's not highly connected. It doesn't really create a lot of large um, cliques. And therefore, the separators are also very small. See how you just have a few large separators. So there's not a lot of parallelism opportunity here. So we, in the end, we got a speed up of around. Uh, 3.7. So, in conclusion, I know this went fairly fast, but I hope I gave you a feeling for the different challenges in, um, associated with uh, system health management. Um, you have uh, you know, this diagnostic problem um, that's computationally hard. And you have oftentimes some type of real-time or soft real-time requirement, and it helps to uh, compile the Bayesian network. Um, emphasize, you know, error a fair amount or uh, error space, but if you have similar issues on mobile devices, I mean, just think about the Internet of Things that's coming when you have uh, not only a few billion devices as you have with cell phones, tens or maybe hundreds or maybe thousands of billions of devices out there and they should ideally stay relatively healthy um, and uh, also spoke about uh, software and power systems different types of faults um, probably compiled based net to an arithmetic circuit or um, uh, uh, junction trees and showed strong performance on the electrical power side and also um, 
how you can use this feedback control idea to achieve, you know, not harm, you know, real time response, but at least a, a reactive or a soft real time response, which is my, you know, more realistic perhaps in many uh, <coughs> types of systems. And then I spoke a little bit about very briefly uh, how to speed up the base net computation using uh, GPU. So, for further information, I'm open for questions. And here's a couple pointers as well as my email address. And let me just flash some more collaborators here. Some of the GP work was done in my PhD student Lou, um, Johan, I mentioned. Um, there's many other people that have been involved in the on the uh, software side. Um, on the feedback control side, I work with uh, A.B. Shiara, who's also faculty here. Um, Yeah. Yes, the first one, here's where you find the papers. Here is just more information about uh, these research directions. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes. Can you make these slides available? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. So you system behavior. And then are you looking at like taking into action based on the action from besides some migrating to it? That would be one yes. aspect. Yes. Another uh, thing I'm wondering is when you're deriving how the system behaves and saying it's a fault, yes. you could potentially say, well, I don't I have several faults it could be. Yes. But I take some action I can observe the system and say this action is where I have a problem. So then we could create a topic. Can you do more of those? Yeah, that's a very good question. They, uh, you know, the tricky, I guess it's sort of a project management issue or, or what you want to call it that led us to focus mostly on the diagnosis, diagnosis side because if you take the corrective action, you need either some kind of simulation. It's not enough to have just a data set. You know, you need to have either the device itself or the vehicle itself <coughs> or some kind of simulation of it. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we haven't had that. We've had, you know, the data but I agree with you that that would be very, very interesting and something that we're focusing more and more on now how to to do the, take the action, but it's not something we have emphasized a lot so far in our work, other than the, the feedback computing. Mm -hmm. sure. and, and one other question, maybe a little bit detailed, I'm just curious, in the speed ups you were doing, do you have any sense of how much of that was related to data movement um, versus the computation? So when you say data movement, what do you think about that? Well, I'm assuming the setup is uh, PC of some sort or a server of some sort, or yeah. GPUs or the PC on that. So yeah. some amount of computations. I know I want to do something, I move it to the GPU, I compute something, move it back, and I move it back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, good question. Um, here, in this case, it's the, the junction tree, so this data structure, is all fits into the GPU. So. It's, it's basically this compilation. Oh, in the previous slide, see that better. We have this compilation. It all takes place on the CPU. Then we push this into the GPU. It's just there. It's there. And then there's a back and forth between the CPU and the GPU. So the CPU, uh, the GPU does the computation between two of these guys. Then the CPU takes over and sort of controls the flow of when the GPU is activated, if you will. But every, all of this data structure sits in the GPU. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there's definitely some details I glossed over. Um, but um, so you are limited currently by the size of the GPU memory for the for this junction tree. On the other hand, we're not, you know, there's a lot of parallelism here we're not taking advantage of. What was the upload of size? Um, these, there was, there was some information about that see here. Um, you see here's the number of junction tree nodes. It ranges from 20 um, up to, in this case, around almost a thousand.
unfortunately, there is, I didn't include the, the total size of the junction tree, but um, you get at least some idea here of the different sizes that we're dealing with. The, you know, these, these uh, cliques, these nodes in the junction tree have, you know, can have something like 500,000 nodes. So a couple things. First, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Mengshul. Mengshul. Okay. And is it uh, a Toronto log name? Uh, are you, Sorry? Are you from Trondheim? Ah, yes. Okay. You're close. All right. So then you know about the tunnels at NTNU? And <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so so I, it was getting warm in here and I was losing track just a little yes. bit. Yes. So sorry about that. But um, I think it sounds like you're starting off with understanding almost in a binary mode what all of the possible states are. And then you're using that to go after real similar, <clears throat> real data from somewhere. And, and then, so what's happening with the error between what you're suggesting are, is, is possible in, in your modeling, uh, what does, if it doesn't fit in your model, what happens to that data? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's always something, uh, if we go back maybe to this, that's a good question. Um, you know, even here, you know, where we uh, perform quite well, you still have false positives and false negatives. Mm. So there's still there's still things that are, you know, uh, either the model is you know not good enough, or there's still I think you know that's the thing with probabilistic things, right? You there's a there's almost a bound to how good you can be. You know, think about the coin, right? You can only be 50% of the time you would be right, 50% of the time you would be wrong, <coughs> unless you have a lot of kind of inside track on how the coin operates. Or if it can no, oh, yeah. figure it out. Yeah, but still, I mean, that's the thing with probabilistic things. You can only be so, there's a bound to how good you can be, yeah. or realistic you can be. I mean, but, you can always say, I want to be 100% correct, mm -hmm. you know, if you believe in quantum mechanics and flipping a fair coin, you know, there's only so good you can be. Mm -hmm. But still, so, and we didn't really tease that out here, but you see, we do have, um, and you can look at some of these other things here, you have a certain detection accuracy, you see here, 96 percent is what we had. Mm -hmm. Some of the other competitors were in the 91 percent, 85 percent. And this is of course for the for that particular type of data that we were sort of expecting mm -hmm. to get. Mm -hmm. So in a real world situation it would probably be a little bit worse than this to be honest because mm -hmm. you know they created sort of a training set and a test set mm -hmm. and there was a fair amount of similarity between the training and the test. Mm -hmm. But they're you know they are quite challenging. Um, they include up to Three simultaneous faults, and um, uh, and so forth. So yeah, but that's a good question. Any other questions? Yes. At several times in your talk, it was pivotal that you limited the topology. Yes. I wonder if, in fact, that's really the magic of this, the lesson that we draw, more than Bayesian networks per se. And, and indeed, you slipped it in originally, so it was just convenient. <laughs> but, but everyone in this room who does software knows that, in fact, software historically had far more power than anyone needed. And the penalty was that far more opportunity to create uh, unexpected yep, mistakes. Yep, yep. If indeed you, you could rigorously guarantee that the software had a topology as simple as the Bayesian network, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What would that buy if, if that became actually yeah, yeah, rigorous rather yeah, than yeah, just yeah. sort of a reasonable approximation? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, the 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 base net also for the software was manually constructed, but I think what we're you're hinting at there is that you could uh, approach that in a more rigorous fashion and sort of actually create the base net more from the from a deeper analysis of the software. Or say that or axiomatically in the design of the software, you have to accept that the software must be subject to this That's right. topology. Certain system. certain structural constraints, certain topology constraints, and you can then, you know, uh, take advantage of that when you're doing the failure analysis and also when you create the basic network. Yeah, that's a very absolutely very good point. <clears throat> yes. 
Could you construct the things in the network from the software? Yes. It's not in the software. I think you could at least do some of it. Um, that is something we would really like to do. And we have been tossing around that idea uh, to do that. Uh, it would be, uh, I think, to really do a good job of that, it would be a non trivial effort, you know, to be honest. It would be a, a decent sized project. It would not be something you could do, you know, very, very simply because it would really, you know, you would sort of, I guess you can think about it sort of as a byproduct of sort of some kind of source code analysis or compilation and sort of on the side or as a separate process, you sort of construct the base net as you analyze the source code. Or, but I think you would also need some sensors that look not only at that, but also what's going on in the operating system, what's going on, at least to create sort of a truly powerful approach, you know, looks at what's happening at different layers of the software hardware stack to, to really get a, a powerful um, um, method. But yeah, that's definitely very interesting. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Do you ever model the false positives and negatives to see if there's some trend? Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good point. The um, the um, I think in general here, what we what we if you compare, I think it's especially over here where we sort of the numbers are a little bit worse. You see that we were quite we really tried to avoid our false positives. We, so we sort of took the strategy that we were waiting, 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 saying we're not sure yet, mm -hmm. we're not sure yet, we're not sure yet. And then once we were very, very sure that there was a fault, we said, okay, there's a fault. Of course, you see the, um, the Stanford team was a little bit more aggressive and therefore had a higher false positive rate. And <coughs> you see that's the case actually uh, for Rodon team. They were even more aggressive and uh, therefore, uh, so it's sort of a trade-off here between false positives and false negatives. Mm -hmm. So, um, and all of, all of this, all of course, depends on whether you're really, really worried about faults occurring and to catch them or not. Mm -hmm. And maybe the type of faults, you have different tolerance for how quick you want to. So you get into a very complex and interesting discussions here, which we, you know, we sort of just had a global philosophy of trying not to create a lot of false positives. That was sort of just our overall philosophy. But I think this is, you know, doing this trade off and for different type of faults, I think it's interesting research topic in its own right, which we didn't really have time to, to really dig into too much in this project. So that's, that's a good question. <clears throat> yes. So here's a question. What is the false positive rate um, for Stanford in China? Yes. Uh, does that give the advantage or trade-off rate um, by having a um, lower mean CPU time in that case? Because that seems to be difficult. To yeah, the uh, the CPU, the, you know, the CPU time here. Yeah, that's a, that's if you're exactly right. They uh, let's see. They were much faster, as you see here, typically. And we were often waiting and waiting. So that's exactly right. Any other questions or comments? All right. That's the case here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.